now we're ready finally to get to the framework, uh, which is, okay, you now know that uh, the human mind can be uh, go astray and that uh, intelligence is not the same as rationality and it's very difficult to think hard. Uh, how do you overcome these biases, these, uh, um, the vividness, the various uh, biases we've talked about? How do you overcome being a cognitive miser, or how do you overcome the mind gaps or contaminated information? And uh, so this is a system I developed over the years, uh, and it's, it's based on hypothetical thinking, which we just uh, have explored a little bit. I've introduced you to you. And I found these old um, uh, printouts I made for, uh, I've give, given the talks on this, as well as using it in my classes all the time. And uh, this is, I did it under the context, so I put, put it there, uh, under the context of information pollution, the paranormal and teaching critical thinking. I guess I gave that talk somewhere to some group, and I don't remember. But I did have my printout there, so I thought I brought that with you, to, just to show you context of this particular version of it. Um, by the way, I first used the term information pollution many years ago. I was asked to give um, at the graduation ceremonies at the University of Oregon. They, after the major <coughs> ceremony with everyone, everyone, all the undergraduates who were graduate getting the degree all together, they split up by different departments. And the honors group, there's an honors college at the university, they have their little tent and their little, they have a little ceremony and each of the other specialties have their own little ceremony. And I was asked to give a, a little talk, I talked to the honors group, and they said, but it can, can't go more than 10 minutes or something like that. <laughs> I'm used to going on forever, okay? And uh, uh, it's very hard to do something like that. So uh, it dawned on me, I was, the internet was coming along and uh, it was proliferating and it's pretty clear that there's a lot of information piling up. <clears throat> and then I did some research and I discovered that there'd been a lot, a lot of theories and work on the accumulation of information in different fields. And I used the term information pollution because, and as the internet grows, it's gonna get worse. The idea is that as more information accumulates in any field, a lot of it's good information, that it keeps growing, but that grows, and I'll show you an example of that, that grows at a linear fashion, whereas the total amount of information grows as a cube. This means that as more information grows, it's harder and harder to find the good information because it's buried in the crap, right? And uh, so that's, I coined that term, and I was surprised. That was, that, that time, it was viral for that time. It got on the internet. And people were attacking me. I had no idea what they, why they were so upset by it. I was saying it was information pollution. And, uh, but I was worried about it at that time, and now it's even worse. The, the problem is how, there's a lot of good information out there, no question about it, but how to find it? That's the most important thing. How do you get to the good information? And that's related to this course as well. What we're talking about now is how do you find the good information among all the bad information? And we're being inundated with bad information, which means that uh, contaminated <coughs> mindware is uh, part of us all because we're being exposed to it all the time. And that's, that's, a, very pro that's a very serious problem. Because even if you don't believe this stuff, even if you're a good skeptic, you're always questioning things, we know that just being exposed to it. I don't know if you've ever heard the illusion of truth. Uh, uh, these things go in fads in a way, but, but it's strong. It, it's been done over and over again to show that it works. The illusion of truth is simply a matter of that just being exposed to certain statements, like global, global warming is a hoax, that just gets you exposed to that. Even though you consciously really don't think it's so or something like that, that increases your belief that that maybe is so. Because it becomes a thing that gets into your memory, the way memory works, it's not like a list or anything like that, it's a network of things. And things, if you stimulate something in that network that explodes, it, it stimulates, it, it go radiates out to other things. And so it turns out that simple repetition, this is why on TV and stuff like that, you watch the same things. Um, my sister watches Fox Network all the time, all day long, and um, uh, I learned not to talk with her about politics or anything like that, because it's, 
triggers certain things. She is sure that Obama, you know, was not born in, 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 in the United States. She's sure he's a, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a radical Islamist. She's sure that. And I could how do you can you get that way? Well, if you have Fox Network on about uh, half the day, it turns out that these people spend more time, rather than attacking uh, or promoting their conservative policies, demonizing the enemy, the people. So that, so that by demonizing them, and the demonizing, if you're just hearing it all the time in the background, because she's working at a computer and other things, you're getting that sinking in there. That becomes what, that, that's what the illusion of truth is all about. It does increase the believability of all that stuff. So just simple exposure. One thing, one example. So now, with this particular talk to these uh, undergraduates, um, I, I would see some of the key issues in critical thinking. This is the way I saw it then, and I've been giving you some of these issues. Garbage in, garbage out. We need a systematic analysis of claims, and that's what this framework's gonna be. There's a principle of charity. I didn't mention it to you before, but um, principle of charity is not something that you're supposed to be nice to everyone, but principle of charity is the force comes from philosophy. It's the idea is that when you are attacking a claim by an opponent or something like that, you should try to reformulate your opponent's claim in the most strongest way possible before you try to uh, destroy it or attack it. Anyway. In other words, so the idea is that, and that's what my framework's all about too, is uh, you're actually giving the benefit of the doubt. You, you're gonna frame that person's claim, a dubious claim, in as strong a case as it can be. Because I was, my first critique of parapsychology was 1957. I was a skeptic ever since I was a kid, because as a kid, I uh, did my first magic show for money at age seven, and uh, I figured this is a great life, you know. And um, I went and began reading books in the library on magic and magicians, and I found there was a guy called Houdini. Was, and Houdini was a great magician, but he also went around exposing spiritual meetings and stuff like that. And I assumed right from, from when I can consciously remember, I always assumed that being a magician, I had to be a skeptic. I had to go around exposing mediums and stuff like that and fake psychics and so on. And I never, so right for my whole life, I've never had uh, the um, experiences that many of the people who come to my toolbox have. They have people who used to grow up as believers in something or other and, and gradually became disenchanted and come to my toolbox to find uh, some other kinds of people that they can talk with now, okay. But so that's the principle of charity. It's very important. It's not that you've got to be nice to the other people, but uh, uh, the reason I bring up my first critique of parapsychology in 1957 was that up until then, I was a skeptic, but I was then a young professor at Harvard University, and the, uh, the editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association, the most prestigious journal in that in the statistics area, asked me to come in in the middle of a dispute to help settle it. There was a dispute where a uh, soul in Bateman wrote a book called Laudan Experience on Telepathy, which at that time was considered the greatest, strongest evidence you could have for telepathy. They had discovered two psychics, you might call them, um, Soul and Mrs. Uh, Barry, I think it was, but who over a period of th three, or four, three or four years consistently scored high, very high, higher than any Ryan's, J.B. Ryan subjects, on ESP tests. And uh, this is considered the best evidence you could possibly have for par parapsychological work. But a man uh, named Price, he was a chemist, wrote a 13-page review of that book. Now, in science. Now, at that time, science like it is today, this was a prestigious journal for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And it is one of the major prestigious journals like Nature and stuff like that in the world of science. And they never had that, at that time, they usually have, at most a book review went two pages. This one was given 13 pages. And the point of the review was that Price decided that 
uh, he went and looked over all J.B. Ryan's work as well as the work by Solon Bateman, and he said, by any scientific standards, these people have made their case over and over again successfully. The statistics are impeccable. The experimental design looks impossible. I mean, there's no way of, 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 of debating it. If, if, and he didn't put that if in here. He said, if, as described, if, as they did write, write in their papers, it really was done that way. So then he brought in David Hume. Some of you have heard of him. How many know David Hume? He's a friend of yours. <laughs> well, David Hume uh, I wrote this very classic article on miracles. And the idea of David Hume's article on miracles was that if a thousand people, maybe 10,000 people, maybe even a million people, came up to you and told you that they had just witnessed a miracle, you'd have to say they are, they are lying or deluded in some way. Because even at, at a million people witnessing that miracle are testifying uh, against the observations of more than a million people that, that have created modern science and the whole basis of science. So that miracle would violate those other observations. So if you pin, pit those observations against the observations, the cumulative observation of all science, it can't be true. That was Hume's idea, that, that you have to decide that, that and maybe when you think about it, what, does, what principle does this bring up that we talked about very early on in the lectures? Uh, do you remember? Vividness, you remember vividness? Again, how even one case, one striking case can uh, turn around uh, people's decisions even against a whole batch of non-vivid, non-colorful statistical data, which is overwhelmingly would argue from one point of view, whereas this one concrete, vivid story or case overrides that. Well, this would be another example of vividness where uh, someone reporting on a miracle, but if you think about it statistically, the miracle, the miracle is, is being put up against many, many observers, many, many times a number of observers who have witnessed something different that creates the whole basis of science. So, um, anyways, uh, when I, uh, this guy Price said, okay, these guys are all cheating. And he, in fact, in some of the experiments we're talking about, they had uh, members of parliament were, were witnesses to it. So, yeah, so he had to involve them as well. And he was accusing an awful lot of people of being liars uh, and cheats. And that created a furor, as you can imagine. And so the January 1956 issue of Science was devoted, unusual, to rebuttals and, and back and forth. Ryan had something to say and, uh, and so on. Uh, and it was at that point that uh, the editor, uh, William Wallace, uh, uh, I think it was, or the editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association came to me and said, Ray, he says, please, write something for our journal which will settle this whole issue once and for all. And you're just the right guy to do it because you're a statistician, you're a psychologist, you're a magician. You've got all the attributes. The other guy we need, I've never done anything like that before. So, okay, I, he talked me into it, and I was young and, uh, uh, and, and walked into it. And unfortunately, in my whole life, and I was, been, was turned around by that. I've been stuck with this. Uh, <laughs> I read, what I did was I read the original data, Ryan's research, as well as this work by Solon Bateman. And the first thing that struck me, it was horrible to me, was that my friends, I had depended on secondhand knowledge of of my skepticism about parapsychology, uh, my friends Martin, Gardner, and other people like that, uh, people I trust. But I discovered that they had misled me in the world. Uh, what they were attacking, they were attacking parapsychology at its worst. There were some terrible experiments, and they were, those were the ones they were attacking. They weren't attacking it at its best. And again, the principal Cherry to me says, hey, you've got to look at it at its best. If you're going to tackle something, look at their best work, not their, not their worst work. That's not fair. Now, either they didn't know it or couldn't understand it or what. But I, I was surprised. That was the first thing I was surprised. Uh, not, it didn't convince me, I, but I found that you had to be more sophisticated in, in, in your attacking their evidence. There were a lot of things wrong with their data, and I spent my career working very hard to show the weaknesses in parapsychology, um, and, and that it just doesn't hold up. Uh, and, uh, but I was really 
it was really a, a terrible shock to me to realize that my fellow skeptics, people I love and trust, I was misled by them because they were, their examples that they were attacking were, were the uh, simple, the examples by people who really weren't at the center of parapsychology. There were re really serious parapsychologists and still are who have a good scientific degree and most of them know their statistics better than their critics. So they are not, you can criticize them, but you can't, you gotta, you gotta criticize them, you gotta be fair. Okay, that's a long uh, uh, side step from, uh, from uh, what we're talking about, but that was the principle of charity, got me going on that. And then there was uh, requirements for good tests for claim, alternative explanation, I'm gonna come back to that later because that's very, very important. Another thing, that's why I brought up Remember when I talked, uh, I quoted uh, Sherlock Holmes? Remember? Yes. Okay. Uh, the idea that we don't, we focus on what actually did occur and not about what could, what didn't occur is, is a standard thing. We, we are focused on, and this is important in perception as well as cognition, we focus on what did happen, what is there, not what didn't happen. And if you're gonna really be able to evaluate claims or anything else, you gotta really understand what could have happened, what didn't happen. And we'll come to that later. And the psychological reasons for believing, you now have more than enough already. Okay, we've gone that far. So inflation, pollution, I'm gonna get by that now. I wanna talk about this pyramid model growth just a little bit. I've already talked about the illusion of truth. You all understand what that is now, okay? So this is where I found a man named DeSola Price wrote a book many, many years ago. He was a historian of science, I think, at Yale. But he specialized in the field and he pioneered it, which was what uh, you might call it empirical his history. It's actually doing history on the basis of data. History of science, he did, they, and there's, there's actually groups now that specialize it. You analyze the change in, in number of publications in different fields over the years and they actually follow laws about it. And you, that to, as a, a, um, a proxy for how much information is growing, how it grows in the field. And so they actually used uh, mathematical laws and stuff and they've done a lot of work on that. And one of the things they found, and this is the pyramid, is that in any field as I mentioned before, if you think of a pyramid, the height of the pyramid represents the amount of good knowledge in any field at any time. But you see as the, fly, as the um, height increase, as the but the total knowledge is, is the uh, um, volume of the cube, okay? And what happens is that the total knowledge increases as the cube of the good knowledge. So by the time, let's say, we get to a volume of 64, uh, we, the, 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 the amount of good information to bad information is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which means it's gonna be tougher and tougher to find. That's, that's the issue there. I've already mentioned that. Now we come to my framework. <laughs> A long time coming, but we're here and we're ready to go. Uh, okay, so first of all, I, st I put it around a series of six questions. I could make some more too, but you want to ask questions like, what is the issue of question? And that, that can come out several ways, but you really want to ask yourself, what is the issue? What is being claimed here? What is the claim? And this is now, we're going to get more specific and we're going to phrase it in a conditional format. That's where that comes in. What reasons are offered to support the claim? How strong is the support? That's the important thing. Okay, how strong is it? What would be adequate support? And what reasons might create false beliefs in the claim? Now, th there you, have, you, you got a lot of, and, uh, you already got a lot of reasons for figuring that out, but each claim is different. We're going to look at it. Okay, so now we come to the conditional format. As I said, uh, I simply put, it's if H, H is gonna be a hypothesis of that something is true of the world, that's the hypothesis, then if that's, if that's true of the world, then something, there should be some predictable consequence, which is P. We call it the predictable consequence. So I said, that's, that's what it originally, and usually is put that way, but then it came out that it's not as simple as that. 
there's things called initial conditions and there are auxiliary conditions. So, and not the way stated here is that this is usually in terms of a background of a, a theory. This T is going to be a theory, a description of a hypothetical system. By the way, this is all in the guide, uh, in, in your guide as well. Uh, H is the hypothesis that the claim, the claim that the theory is true. So the the, we, the, we don't think of the theory as true or false, not thinking of it that way, but the theory can generate claims and uh, our hypotheses. And a hypothesis is, is going to be a claim that something is true, that a consequence of the hypothesis is true. That's going to be testable. We're going to have initial conditions are the initial conditions for evaluating the claim, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about they, these two can be interchangeable to some extent. Auxiliary conditions are conditions that must hold for the claim outcome to occur. And then P is predicted outcome given that the hypothesis is true and the initial auxiliary conditions are met. Now, what this does though is gives a lot of loopholes. You've got to be careful. Um, for example, I have yet, yet to encounter a field parapsychological experiment which has been, uh, has, has, has really uh, made an uh, impression on the parapsychologists because they believe an important auxiliary condition is that the conditions have to be right, I mean, initial condition. They have to be, there is something they call psi-conducive conditions. Unfortunately, they don't know what psi-conducive conditions are until after they've done the experiment and they don't get anything. Then they can say, okay, it's due to psi-conducive conditions. This is an example of a non-falsifiable theory, and this is where Papa maybe is relevant. Um, but for their point of view, uh, you know, psi is a very subtle thing. It's real, but it also, it only shows itself under certain conditions. And they've never been able to specify the conditions in advance. Since they can't specify them in advance, they know that they must have been existing. Uh, they must have the, these initial conditions weren't fulfilled. How do they know it? Because they didn't get the predictive results. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, so you can see how people can get themselves, even the brightest people can get themselves into tremendous uh, mess. And they don't like it when I point it out, but I understand that. Uh, we're, I'm still good friends with some of them, at least where I'm talking, grounds. And, um, and by the way, we all, we all, can get caught up in this as well, it's not just parapsychologists. Okay, so let's go take an example of the key bending. We did, I'll just give you an example, how you might go through this. So you might ask, what is the issue or question? Now we can say, can a key be bent without physical force by an unknown psychic power? Is that a good, that may be one possibility, but the issue can be a lot of other things. Anyone else want to propose a, another issue that might be involved in there? That, that, so there's no one correct issue, but you're trying to, at least say some issue that's involved here, that, that a question that, that, that's me. Um, can unknown psychic powers act on things? Can, can that, psychic powers act on things? Yeah. Okay, so that's a more general statement. Uh, so instead of key, can there be, and it's good, you can put it in a more general, it can be you specifically asking that question about keys themselves, or you may be asking a more general question about metal bending in, in general, psychic metal bending, other spoons, keys, other things, or you may be even making an even more general statement, a belief that this is part of a, uh, that there is something called psychokinesis, where the mind can move objects of any kind, okay? So you can spe spell this out in a lot of different ways, but at least it's worthwhile trying to formulate a claim, or, or a reasonable claim that's being made here. Okay, so now let's put it into the hypothetical format of our thing. The theory here could be a description of a hypothetical system which metal can be bent by mental powers. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a more general thing, it could be uh, a, a hypothetical system in which there is something called psychokinesis where the human mind can bend or, or move or somehow influence physical objects of any kind. So you can put it, make it more general or you can make it more specific to be metal, or you can make it more, even more specific to be just keys. Uh, okay, the hypothesis could be, see this theory is neither true nor false at the moment. 
We're not saying that. It's just a basis for, gen for driving some hypotheses that we could test. One hypothesis could be the theory is true with some individuals. So that, that raises the question that we can be saying that, uh, uh, okay, so let's leave it at that at the moment. So initial, one initial condition is that we begin with an unbent key. That's a very simple thing. Because you began with a bent key and then found that the key is bent afterwards, got nothing, right? <laughs> so we then want to be sure that the key is unbent to begin with. So we got an unbent key. An auxiliary condition could be the lead psychic strokes the key and truly wants it to bend. Uh, or it could be that the, there are psych that there's no skeptics around that can influence it. By the way, the, the, the idea that skeptics can badly influence it already presupposes it, like begging a question, that the skeptics have psychic powers too, <laughs> because they, they can interfere with the powers of the psychics, right? But uh, they never look at it that way. But anyways, the alleged psychic strokes the key and truly wants it to bend, so that could be a, a auxiliary condition that, that uh, unless it's stroked, you, you don't expect the prediction to work, right? So, so it has to be stroked. And, and, the, and then you hold it in your Guru Geller grip, as I tried to make the call, okay? Um, you could have it, though, that the key can bend without anyone touching it, or even stroking it, and that the key could bend by just focusing on it, okay? But let's put it that way. Okay, and the predicted outcome is that the key will be bent. So, I always look at this. The initial condition is that you have an unbent key, and the final condition will be, which is the predicted outcome, and a bent key. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. Okay, so let's, uh, so a bent key was displayed, uh, was displayed when we did the thing. So our example was that we did, what reasons are offered to support the claim? And I showed a key that was bent, okay? That after it was initial and it wasn't bent before. But it wasn't bent a lot, but it was bent, right, clearly. So that was the, bent key. So that was the reasons that are offered to support the claim that we have a bent key. And by the way, is that enough reasons to, to put forth? Uh, let me stop here and say, is it enough reasons? I have, to have observed that the auxiliary conditions were bent. Okay, what were the auxiliary, and she says that uh, we have to observe the auxiliary conditions were met. That's true, we got to have meet conditions. Right, the right. The what else key. might you put in the auxiliary conditions, or initial conditions even? Right. Yeah. That the key not be touched. Uh, that what, what's that? That the key not be touched before it gets bent. Well, actually, yeah, we, we, actually we, 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 I touched it, and, and they touched it. We had oh. two volunteers, and they touched it, I touched it, and we stroked it. The question is, uh, you want to make sure that we didn't touch it with, in, in a way that could bend it. Right. Okay, within, yeah. Within the yeah, yeah. And one process. way we checked that out a little bit, so I, we did, I did make it, that after he was bent, we handed it out to people and said they, they could not unbend it with their hands, okay? So that, that's a little bit there, but that's a good point, an excellent point she brought up, that the key, uh, that someone shouldn't touch the key, or if they touch it, we want to make sure that wasn't sufficient to have that been the cause of it. Okay, how strong is the support? The bent key had been marked beforehand to preclude switching, because that was a, People, uh, like in past uh, performances, people most often guess that, well, I just switched the key for a bent one. Uh, so we had the key this time marked to preclude that. However, the key had been out of sight and in the demonstrator's possession for several minutes before it apparently bent. So that was not a good thing for uh, pr uh, proving that this was a miracle or something. Was it possible to physically bend it during that time? Okay, that's the question we want to know. This depends upon knowing about the principle of leverage and realizing that the demonstrator had another key in his hand at the same time. He also had possession of a key that subsequently was bent. There's a lot of ways you can put this, but again, just, just trying to follow a frame like, framework like that gets you to thinking and gets you to think that otherwise things that you might not, might not, might not overlook, might overlook. This is why you have checklists when every time the plane's gonna go up in the air, these guys go through systematically this checklist. The more systematically you have, the less likely you are to miss something that you, <coughs> and it's very easy to do that. So what would be adequate support? Here we want clear, clear, clear evidence that the key 
was not uh, bent before the demonstration, could not have been bent by physical force during the demonstration, and it's not always easy to set, to, 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 to determine in these kinds of things. The setup should contain observational conditions that are optimal for making sure these precautions were adequate. Now, let's give uh, the devil his due. Uh, I did have some negative things to say about Targ's recent book on uh, physicist proof for ESP, and I uh, uh, vehemently said this was a, an insult to science in a way. Uh, it was a, certainly a dereliction of, of duty, uh, of, of forgetting about the last 400 years of scientific revolution and going back to the age of miracles uh, because he doesn't take into account at all any of the criticisms and so on. But in this case, uh, Tar uh, Uri Geller was first investigated seriously uh, by experiments at Stanford Research Institute over a period of several weeks. And uh, most people don't realize this. It's always presented that the results were successful and they, they validated Geller as a psychic. What, what people don't realize and forget about was that Uri Geller was the scientist, the uh, Targ and Putoff, the two physicists at Stanford Research Institute in the 70s when Geller was being tested there. They set out deliberately to test their interest in his metal bending powers, not any other psychic powers he might have, but in his ability to bend metal without using physical force. And they set up their cameras and everything to do this. So they really set up ideal, good observational conditions. They had, so they would have cameras in every angle you could have it. And, and if he was putting any force, he even had the calibration uh, to measure how much force he was actually putting into it. So they wanted to really get this, pin it down in really good scientific fashion. And unfortunately, most of the time he was there, it never, they never could get him to do that. What would happen was they would, work for hours and hours trying to get him to have to bend the key or bend the spoon or do some other uh, psychokinetic thing uh, under the observations where there'd be no doubt that they got it, they pinned it down scientifically. It never would work, so they get, they'd have to break after a few hours of this because it was straining on Geller, supposedly he was, you know, <laughs> working his way and then and his powers were getting weak. <laughs> so, so they would take a break and they would go off to the, have a cafeteria and have some coffee or something and then while they were at the cafeteria, suddenly spoons were bending all over the place. They said, now he's hot now. They'd run back to the laboratory, turn the cameras on, and again, nothing would happen. <laughs> and this went on for weeks and weeks. And so, because, and Geller suggested it himself, because this is strain on Geller as well as them, they decided to have some breaks and do some other things. And Geller suggests, why don't we tie, do this test with a die in a box? And so they put a die in a file box and shaken, and Geller would try to guess what the top face of the die was. And when they opened it up, he was right eight out of eight times. They did it 10 times over the period of time, and two times he was not right. I mean, he, did, he didn't guess. He said, I don't have a feel for it. So, uh, that was one of the things that they published in the Nature paper of, of, of evidence they had for him being able to uh, see that. And then he also did some experiments where they had him draw a figure while he was in a Faraday cage, believe it or not. Draw, uh, they drew something outside the cage. And he drew a figure and then he tried to duplicate it while he was in a cage and he was pretty accurate. They have some pictures of it. Like one, one of the things they drew was a, um, a, 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 a set of grapes, a bunch of grapes you know, with 18 or grapes in a bunch. That was the drawing, they are trying to predict them. Geller came out with a drawing of a bunch of grapes, 18. That was one of the best things ever. <laughs> in, in, in psych, I still see this thing, one of the greatest psychic feats of all time. Geller got it exact. Most things you get, you don't get it, you get it close, that's good enough. Uh, and, but he got it exactly in that one. Uh, so their evidence, what they pointed as success for Geller was in the psychic stuff, but they had to admit that on metal bending, they could get no evidence whatsoever. So at least they did that right. And if they got the evidence under the condition they did that, that would be very impressive. But that didn't happen. Um, so at least in that case, they were right. Now it's interesting that in his book, which I said he, he uh, 
He's giving all kinds of things which, why you should believe in ESP and why he believes in ESP. So he does finally mention Gell. It's amazing that he doesn't talk much about Gell, but he talks about all kinds of other stuff. And he, like, was one scientist spent most of his, a lot of time with Geller, and was a good friend, became good friends. But all this time, all those years, he was dubious because they couldn't get it about Geller's ability to bend metal psychically. But yeah, I don't know if they, they have spoon bending parties. There was a man named Hauk, and I, and I was on the government committee. We actually looked at that as well because uh, there were people in the military intelligence who were going to these spoon bending parties, and it was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander, John Alexander, who's still around and does other things psychically. He was running spoon bending parties while he was still a colonel in the, uh, in the Army, uh, all over Washington, D.C. Spoon bending parties are where people never bent a spoon with their mind or any other way, uh, and would never think of wanting to bend spoons, but now they're going, they was put forth and still is on the web. You can get them, go to them as well. But back in the high heyday of Uri Gallup, people were running these spoon bending parties, you pay a little bit of money and they were gonna transform your whole life. And you sit in it with your spoon in a group like this, like we have here, sitting here maybe, and you're encouraged to keep shouting, Ben, Ben, Ben. <laughs> and, um, and you hold the spoon and you, you're supposed to not f uh, focus on what your hands are doing and you're supposed to try to encourage everyone else and, and shout and get, it's, it's like a revival meeting and so deliberately you, you get going and by the end of the meeting, uh, uh, at sometime during the meeting, someone will say, well my spoon is bent a little bit. And everyone goes, hallelujah, and they, go, they shout and they're all excited. And then other people say, my spoon's bent too. And pretty soon a lot of people say their spoon is bent. It turns out during the meeting, this Ralph Hauk who grunts with me, that, he, that people run them differently. Hauk uh, says, first of all, you must never have skeptics there, because that, that destroys them. But, but the other thing is that they gave, gives them a bunch of rules. And one of the rules is that uh, you do, at some point, when it gets getting very hot and you get, I mean, you're getting very high and you feel the, feel the, the, the psychic power is running through you, start to bend yourself by, by pushing some power, but, but not enough to make it fully bend, you know, but enough to get it going, and then it'll go itself, okay? Ah. And um, so this is what happened. So all, this, all these years, it turns out that Targ, as believing in everything else, uh, Madame Blavatsky and talking to the dead, everything he believes in, he was still skeptical about spoon bending. Even though he saw in his colleagues and stuff like that, they were, they were giving him reports of it. Everyone was going to spoon bending parties and spoon, their spoons were bending. He still was skeptical about it. So he did have skepticism about it. In the book he says, but he finally lost his skepticism. He went to a spoon bending party and he knows that the spoon was big, heavy spoon he had. And uh, at the end of the uh, spoon bending thing, he looked and his spoon was bent. He commits. Notice what's going on here. Statistically, this is kind of a vividness thing we talk again about. One example that happened to him, where his, the spoon bent while he was in his hands, he trusted because it was in his hands and he felt it, so it's real now. Thousands and thousands of other people, his friends, many of them too, they had it happen to him, had put the same experience. That wasn't good enough for him, right? But, but when it finally happened to him, and under conditions where he doesn't say he measured the spoon beforehand to see whether it was bent, he doesn't give no details about that, he doesn't give us any details about anything else, he doesn't talk about the possibility that, you know, under these high-powered high conditions where it's psychology, everyone knows that you can suddenly bend the spoon, do anything like that, without realizing that you're doing it, you know. You can feel that you're putting it in, cause, and you're encouraged to do that, that, that the thing now is bent, and you don't believe that you did it. In fact, it, it, uh, several times I've encountered people, I'm, I'm not allowed into them, but after the parties I've been around and I've talked to people who come out of it with their bent spoon, and I say, well, did you bend it yourself? Are you putting pressure on it? He says, oh yeah, but not that much. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, then we come to general. So that's the framework. I'm going to now, do we have, uh, uh, my time is? Uh, 20 minutes. How much? 20. 20 minutes, okay, so we do have time. Let's go through another example. And this example, uh, I think, I may have put the case in your, uh, 
I'm not sure I put that one in a guide, but I'm going to put it up here for you anyways. This first case, we're going to do two cases, uh, if we have time. Uh, this one is called, I love this, I, I just love this case. Uh, it's small, here it is, I think we can do it here. This was from a book by a uh, major, uh, again, I love this British people, they have all these degrees and stuff. Oh, you do have it, okay. So it's the same one. So you have it in the guide as well, but I'll put it up here. For, 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 can, can we, uh, so we, but, whoops, I am sorry. Okay. Okay, it says polarity therapy at the top, which you can see. And it, it's, it's extracted from Cooper Hunt Major, this is the way he has it in his title, C-L-M-A Cantab, I guess that's Cambridge, right? He's got some sort of degree from Cambridge. P.S. D, doctor of, what's that, psychology, not psychology, is it? MSD, DD, PhD, MSF. That's, that's, a, that's a good number of degrees. Uh, 1969, radio aesthetic analysis. That's uh, using the dowsing rod and, and the uh, pendulum to, to diagnose things. Okay, so here it's the full thing. And we're gonna apply, I want, we're gonna apply the, uh, framework to it, okay? Whether one employs a rod or pendulum or one of the latest instruments designed to detect and measure the radiations of the human body in its many cell groups, there is almost an infinite number of findings which can be of the utmost value to an inquirer. One very useful reading, and by the way, and I love this, one very useful reading to begin at the beginning of our specialized form of analysis which my wife and I have evolved over the years in our radio aesthetic healing practice is the polarity of the patient. Hitherto, <laughs> it, hit it, it had always been thought that we should sleep at night with our heads to the north and our feet to the south. I, I never heard that before, but before I read this, but I guess I'm out, out of touch with things. Uh, so how many of you have heard that? I mean, no, you're supposed to sleep with your head to the north and to the south. Okay, so we don't, we, we, not everyone is aware of these things. Now you learn, no. We have found through radiesthesia that this varies with the individual. Some should sleep with their head to the southeast or southwest, northeast or northwest, according to the finding of the instrument. As to the supreme, let's make sure we can see that. Okay, as to, what's that? As to the supreme importance of this, we cannot say as yet, and since we are not anxious to produce fattest or disrupt the domestic harmony by dislocating arrangement of the furniture, we do not lay down an inflexible law for any patient. At the same time, we have found the item to be of practical value clinically. May I cite two cases of actual fact? By the way, when I was reading over this paragraph, I was saying when he saw that problem of, um, of uh, disrupting domestic harmony, I was thinking of the wife having to sleep with her head at the foot of the bed and the husband yeah. sleep with the head at the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. The first was a patient who complained of acute insomnia, which nothing would relieve. We discovered that the lady was sleeping with his, her head in the wrong polarity. <laughs> Radius CG, uh, you laugh, but this is serious business. Uh, sleep loss is a very... Uh, 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 unhappy situation. Radio aesthetic examination indicated a different alignment and the patient advised to try it out. She braved the domestic strife and her subsequent report was complete harmony and sound sleep. Uh, in other words, during the hours of nightly refreshment, the cosmic forces of, renewed, of renewal were unhindered by incorrect polarity in the sleeper and were allowed to flow freely through the inner being of the patient. Uh, so there, there, there are things that, you, that you're learning in this course that are valuable, I'm sure. Uh, the other case I can cite was one of a little girl who was greatly troubled, troubling her household by extreme restlessness during the night. She was brought to us for a test of polarity and our advice was adhered with an immediate satisfactory result of complete harmony and deep sleep. I can only add, therefore, in conclusion that the test of polarity and applying of it in this way, provided that friction is not caused in the household, seems worthwhile. It is easily ascertainable by any work with the pendulum or rod. 
that is, etc., by holding a specimen of the patient's blood or hair or handwriting in the receiving hand, left hand or right handed operator, maintaining the desired thought and consciousness while functioning with the power hand which holds the pen. And that's that complete report of that particular thing. Now we want to apply a framework to it, right? Because this would be, if this were so, this would be mind shot, earth running, I guess. It would be like magic. Right. And uh, I'm a magician, so uh, that would be fine. I mean, I see use my act, I guess. Okay. So what factors, oh, and that's not, not what I want. That's that. I want that. Well, I thought I had an analysis here somewhere on that. Oh, no, okay, I do have an analysis there. Let's go through the thing uh, now. Uh, this is say, what are the reasons, uh, what is the claim being made here? What would you say the claim is? That um, people have trouble sleeping because there, there's something wrong with um, polarity. That there, that they, there is polarity that can go wrong and cause insomnia. Okay. That's better. And there's one more aspect of the claim. It's possible to measure the right polarity. Yeah, but the other, what's, an ad, yeah, what's the added feature here? Changing it. That you can change it. Yeah. Right? You can cure their 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 uh, problems by by making them sleep in the right polarity, right? Okay. So you, so the claim is that if that if people having trouble with sleeping, uh, any problems with sleeping, if you could uh, if you find what they're, that they're, there's a polarity problem there, if you get them to sleep with, according to the right polarity, the right direction, uh, it will be cured, right? So there's a couple of claims, I guess. There is polarity, I guess, but the, and the stronger one is that this, uh, if you can, if people reorient and sleep according to the correct polarity for them, they will be fine. Okay? Okay. Okay, so, that, so now let's get that into the um, framework. The hypothesis would be what? We're going to test it now, okay? I would. You, you got to tell, see, uh, we're going to use the principle of charity, we're going to do one other thing as well. We're going to assume that this guy did this as an experiment correctly. So, so okay, so what is the, uh, what is, what is the hypothesis? hypothesis? Yeah. What's that? When sleeping in the right direction of matching polarity, subject receives proper uh, deep sleep. Okay, but now you have to have initial condition. What would be initial condition? It's very important here. What's that? <laughs> but they have to have problems, sleep problems. Interrupted. Yeah, they have to have sleep problems and they get the wrong polarity. But okay, so that could be the initial condition is that they have to have sleep uh, problems, sleeping, right? And because uh, if they didn't have sleep problems and they don't have sleep problems afterwards, that's no test of anything, right? right. So, so, so it's very important that it's an initial condition that you, you got to demonstrate. And how would you demonstrate that though? How do you demonstrate that they have um, sleep problems to begin with. Mm -hmm. the subject, I, I suppose you could, right? So, so, so you're using testimony. Right? You're using te their, 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 their word for it. They're, 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 they're telling right. <laughs> okay, how, how do you test that they've improved their sleeping habits? Well, they at, least, at least one of these cases, it was the rest of the family complaining. Right. And I suspect the, the woman, you know, her spouse might have been aware of the fact that she, so. Okay, so you have the other person. So, so there, so there is a problem. If you're going to set this up as a test, it's a problem of how you're going to uh, what we call the criteria. How are you going to what criteria are you going to use? You got to set this up. Any good experiment, a scientist think you got to have something that you can measure or show. It got to be a change from see initial condition. You got to be able to specify what that is and be measurable. Something that's measurable, and you got to be a. a Final condition, you know, that's the predicted outcome, which is a measurable change from the initial condition. And without that, you don't have anything, right? A witness. I'm sorry. A witness. Somebody. A witness. Okay, yeah, so somebody maybe you have a witness. Yeah. So we got a problem, but we got to set this up somehow, rather. We got to. Uh, this is not going to be an easy thing to do all the time. We have to set up criteria. We have to have work out measures for it. Uh, otherwise, we're left with people's. Uh, testimonies which we know are what? 
<laughs> I'm reliable, right. Okay. So you have to find some ways of, of, of measuring this and uh, working at it. Well, you should have a controlled, you should really have a controlled situation. Okay, that's another problem. You don't know whether she went home and drank a glass of warm milk. Okay, now, now you're getting into another issue, which is, see, this way we, this hopefully the framework gets you to think this way. Get into another issue that, um, okay, a, a control condition here. What would be a control, a good control to have here? And they have sleep labs. They have sleep labs. That's, okay. I thought what you were getting at was um, that one control would be to have, uh, to actually miss, half the people are given the wrong polarity uh, issue, and, and the other half are given the correct polarity right. issue, and, and so half the people are now sleeping the wrong way according to the polarity judgment, half the people sleeping the right way, and they don't know that, got to be double blind. And then see, again, a double-blind analysis has got to be done to see which ones, how, what proportion of people, if there's a difference in the number of people who are sleeping correctly as opposed to the incorrectly. And that would be a, 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 a reasonable thing to try. Yes? Ten minutes? Okay, good, thank you. Um, any other things people want to say about that? Okay, we've got 10 minutes, I'm going to just introduce you, and we've got a complete analysis, I think, in the uh, thing, on the, uh, this, this paper by Kreider. I think i give you that, uh, a case of a character analysis. I mean, I assume after you get all this done, then you go back and look at their thing and see whether it's met the framework, which obviously didn't. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you, I'm going to say that you can go on and, and yeah, try, try it yourself. I'm just, I'm going to start just giving you some possible suggestions. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do, uh, work on, was this, um, it's, I think it's in the thing here, I hope I, I, hope I have a, uh, oh, here it is, I got both of them here, yeah. I, I sort of, uh, I, I, actually, the full paper actually is not much longer than this, but I give, I give you the gist of the paper, hold it. This is a study that was published in 1944 by a man named Kreider, a psychologist named Kreider, and this is 1944, and he, was teaching at an all-girls school. In those days, uh, girls who do go to school they were from the upper class and uh, well-heeled because uh, many girls didn't go to college. And when they did go, they usually went to an all-female college to protect them or something like that. I don't know. But this is a different world, okay? You've got to remember that 1944 is different from the world that you were, our people are aware of. Okay. Anyway. He's a psychologist, and he, he does a study, of, he publishes a study of a character reader, Margarita S., he calls her. And she's 30 years old and had been a character analyst for 15 years. Her clients gave her excellent testimonials. To test her abilities, Kreider conducted the following experiment. Margarita saw each of the 16 female college students from Kreider's class in the author's office. Each student was seen individually. The analysts made a series of statements about each student. The statements were made one at a time and written down. The subjects had been instructed not to react to the statements. Margarita made from 19 to 25 separate statements about each student. After the 19 or more statements were written down, they were abandoned, handed to the student who checked those which, which she agreed, okay? So you can see what's going on here. The student comes into the office and sits opposite the character reader. The character reader doesn't talk to them, and the student's not, is, is, is not supposed to give them any clues or anything, and the character reader looks, can look at them and writes down statements, each one statement to a card, and then has a stack of cards for that student. Each student <coughs> is given a says, and he gives, a couple of the readings. This is one reading from one of the students. They're all similar in many ways. This had 25 statements. And he says, overall, um, reported that in seven of the analyses, there was no disagreement at all. So in seven of the analyses, no disagreement. In only one of the analyses, were there as many as three disagreements? All told, for the 16 analyses, Margarita made a total of 364 statements. Of those statements, the students disagreed with only 22. In other words, the students agreed with 96% of the statements made by Margarita. Now, Kreider provided two of these things. I'll give you one of those 
you, know, you may want to look at some of, if you haven't looked at them, uh, some of the statements she made. Does not like to take chances. Very, very sensitive. Very self-conscious. Gets along well with boys. Above average student. Worries about her studies. Introvert. Over emotional, tries to conceal it. General health good. I love that one. <laughs> love life not in the settled stage. Remember, these are uh, young undergraduates, college undergraduates. Okay. Has had a broken love affair. Should not be in the business world. And at that time, of course, that would be a fair <laughs> statement to say. <laughs> you won't dare say that today, but uh, that would be a fair statement. That would, that everyone seemed to accept it. That, okay. Appreciates good music. Must always have feeling of security or else is uneasy. Uh, how many here would be uneasy if they didn't have a feeling of security? <laughs> <laughs> um, is of generous and cooperative nature. Digestive organs normal. That's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> Heart normal. Kidneys normal. Finds it hard to ask favors. Should not be given technical work. Does not like routine either. Very stubborn. Bad temper when aroused, yet she doesn't display it often. Uh, this is what we call, my colleague Norman Sumberg calls a double-barreled statement. Uh, this girl would be happiest when being supported. Uh, <laughs> has many big dreams. Okay. And the others were like that. Uh, he only gave two examples in his paper. They were like that. These are, he picked obviously because they were good ones. And uh, Kreider then stated that psychology may say that the statements are mostly complementary, that they are too general, that they reply to everyone. However, from what I knew of the students, I was in substantial agreement with the analyses as presented. More interesting is the fact that the students were satisfied. And in their discussion with each other, following the analysis, they were of the opinion that the analyses were surprisingly accurate. Kreider supplies a statement from Marguerite there, but I won't go over that. He concludes that since she is one of the several who are doing similar work, I believe it is of considerable interest to psychologists to know how our competitors work. Much better, in fact, to try to understand than to scoff at them. Okay, so that was from, from at that time, 1944, a legitimate psychologist, presumably, who wrote that paper, published in the journal, um, Journal of Social Psychology, okay. And um, that was a stimulus for a later paper, which we're going to cover. I'm finally going to give you Randy. I'll show you a clip of Randy actually duplicating. Uh, that experiment of a later one, a man named Forer, who in 1949, this was done in 44, read this paper by uh, Kreider, and he was, I guess, sort of skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at this series of statements, and he said, well, one thing wasn't done, you know, that uh, you should always think about in, in experiments and, and think about like the, the case of the dog that didn't bark in the night. What would happen if this, we mixed these up and gave, gave this one to some other girl and the other girl got the other ones reading? What would happen there? We have, that's an important control, right? So Ford essentially did something like that. That, that became very famous and uh, we'll get to that in the next lecture. Uh, and uh, we're going to get into begin working on what's called the psychic reading. Uh, so uh, I think it, it's a good time to stop here. But go through your own analysis. Go try to apply the framework to this. And then look at the, I think I give a sample analysis in the, uh, of, of what, how I did it. But before you look at my analysis, try your own analysis on it. Just try to see the framework, see what you come up with here. And uh, I can see, by the way, you're smiling and so on, that you're already ahead of the game, but that's okay. You're skeptics. <laughs> and so I guess the next lecture uh, is lecture six. And uh, we will uh, use that to transition to what I call the psychic reading. And uh, 
we will then go from there to uh, teach you all how to be psychics. <laughs>